Hi, we're with Peter and Midnight Madness. Nice. Okay. Right? Awesome. Thanks, Brian. All right. Well, everyone collected some questions. We've been 
their minds. Uh, there are so many wonderful, indelible images and uh, iconography that you conjure in this film. What was the original one? Was it the red dress? Was that the original sort of image that came to mind? I think the mannequins more than, than the dress. Um, I remember the mannequins appeared in your last film as well, and I was wondering if there was a correlation. <sighs> I was pretty scared of them when I was a kid. I used to go to department stores. Um, but there's this sculptor called Keenholz. who did these remarkable mannequin sculptures with resin dripping down their faces. It was absolutely terrifying. So that was a very strong one of the many starting points. And I, I, I want to, before throwing it out to the audience, I want to ask Mary and Gwendolyn, what is it like to work with Peter Strickland? <laughs> the, there's, there's, your filmmaking, Peter, is so decisive. Uh, and I'm just wondering, are you, uh, are you sharing the whole picture with the cast, or are they only seeing just their, their, their individual scenes and their moments? Uh, no, he's, he's extremely collaborative, but he knows exactly what he wants. You know, yeah. he's, he's very clear about his vision and, and, and what it is he, he's trying to do. But um, I've started calling it Strickland Land and <laughs> visiting this sort of world that he creates and being able to play in it. So it's very fulfilling for us and quite freeing when you've got somebody like that. So there's, is there opportunity for spontaneity and, and sort of... Oh yeah, certainly. I mean, there's no sort of improvisation or anything like that. It's very sort of clear, but within that, there, there's, there's, there's room to explore the relationships and, and, and really sort of connect. The other question I have is regarding the magnificent washing machine monologues. <laughs> and... <laughs> The, the, the kind of, ha, I'd be very interested in the writing process of whether there was significant research involved or was it more a, a study of, I guess, the mechanics of washing machines in which words just simply sounded nice together. Uh, that, I just, I'm so fascinated by those haiku-like poems. Does anyone here fix washing machines? <laughs> um, okay, I'm lucky. Uh, well, it was maybe started, well, a number of things. It was uh, uh, Tim Gain who did the soundtrack. Um, I asked him to make some demos for me. Um, even though I didn't have a script, I didn't even have an idea. I just wanted to write to music that I could use because usually when I write to music, I become very attached to it. It's very hard to unglue myself. Um, so he did these very long drones, I mean, these were like 20 minute drones each. And, um, just, you know, work on the page and start, you know, using words like wigwag and basket drive and just, I guess it's a bit like a rap, really, just kind of comes out. Um, but I think it all ties in with this, the film is all about, with all due respect to Marianne and Gwendolyn, um, optics are competing with the, with the actors and it's a, it's a tactile film, it's, it's about texture and um, not just physical texture, but sonic texture, and our um, tactile response to these things. I have, I only recently found out I have this thing called Autonomous Sensory Meridian Response, um, or what, since the English love acronym is AS ASMR, which is whispering a certain weight of paper with a page turning. So the film is, I guess, it's designed to kind of fall asleep to, really. Um, so I guess that's where it comes in. Do we have a question? Yes, right there. I just wanted to ask about the, that first washing machine going, I guess, going crazy and how you achieved that scene. The question is regarding pulling off the, the washing machine, out, uh, the, the one that uh, destroys itself. Well, I suppose what was, what was used to make that effect and also uh, maybe what, what was it like to work with that washing machine? <laughs> <laughs> I won't go into the effect, but it was, I mean, we just didn't know what was going to happen. To be quite honest with you, the machine did its own thing, so you, we were a bit scared of it. You know, bits were flying off, and we, we had one chance, right? So it was, let's go for it, let's look as scared as we possibly can at this moment, and, you know, what's which wasn't hard. 
And, and Peter, how did you achieve it? Did you just throw a cursed rest into the washing machine? <laughs> oh, that was the special effects team, really. But I think I look more terrified than Marion. I think the camera should have, should have been on me in that scene. Uh, yeah, I mean, as Marion said, we had one go. Um, but just, it's just a low-budget film. There's not enough money to, or, or time. So um, I was in a bad mood after that scene because it was supposed to turn towards camera to turn the other way. Um, it was just um, a diva, that washing machine. Um, so, no, we didn't get what we wanted. No. Um, right over there. The, the inspiration for the, the scene where they're they're cleaning the mannequin and the the, uh, the orgasm, I suppose, the climax. Uh, well, I, I guess all this came from clothing and human presence on clothing. Like all of us, when we go home tonight, we're going to have some kind of bodily fluid in our clothes. You know, sweat, cum, blood, all these things. And, um, it's one of the inspirations was I, I bought a second hand pair of corduroy trousers which had a cum stain on them. Um, not these ones. Um, but it kind of activates storytelling, really. Um, you think about who had it before you, what they got up to. Um, but it's, it's a really powerful thing. You see that kind of thing when Marion's character sees Gwen's underwear in the laundry minutes. She's disgusted by it. Vince is the opposite. He wants his face printed on the underwear, so he can't get enough. So it's really red with his type fetish. And so I mean, the film is exploring many ideas around clothing. And I guess the body fluids, you know, with the menstruation, it was the idea that maybe this blood is involved in um, making this dress. Um, we work, I shouldn't say this, but we, in the script, the, uh, the sperm landed on a dress which dried the next morning into a beautiful pattern, which a, a lady bought. Um, so I like this idea of unknown bodily fluids making beautiful designs. I mean, it, it's such a huge world that you, you build here. This is, this is a great Q&A. Here, I want you to come back up here. Um, I, 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 did, did you ever, and we talked about this earlier t tonight, you, you don't have to go into, into it if you, if you don't want to, but it just seems like there's so many more stories. Do you have ideas for where they, like, I want to see these characters again, these major D's, and, like, do you have, were there more stories planned, or was it always just the two, the two stories? No, there were more stories planned. Um, I could go on, well, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I mean, it's, it's an open thing, it, it, the dress is going to continue. Um, but I think the important thing, the important thing for me was to, to, to love the characters, that um, this is not like a slasher film where you die for having sex or whatever. There's no judgment to this. This is a, a random force. Um, I wanted it, when I wrote it, to really uh, regret all these characters dying, um, to see their frustrations at work, their boredom, their, their difficulties at home. I mean, yeah. Right there. Oh, okay. So Barry Adams has done a lot of interesting film score type work. But how did he get involved in this project as an actor? How did Barry Adams get involved as an actor in this film? Uh, that was Shaheen Baik who was casting the film. Um, I was looking for someone involved in music. I just thought it was quite interesting to find people from other parts of life. Um, and she said, "Why not Barry?" And I, I, I was a fan. I would, the first album I bought was Eat Eat was Schmiedepus back in 1996, and it made complete sense. Um, I mean, both of you, you've known him on and off as, as well. Uh, I, mean, I, would, I mean, maybe you can say that. Yeah, um, I mean, I can't say how it came about, but certainly working with him, because I was also familiar with um, Oedipus, Schmiedepus, uh, but it, it, it just worked, you know. He was so lovely and there was a vulnerability about him that just really worked in the role. Yeah. Yeah, yeah the great, great dynamic was the comment. Over there. No. Had, had I, she seen the dress was the question. And what did it feel like to put it on? 
What was it like to wear the dress? Yeah, actually it was really quite nice because it is nothing like I would ever kind of wear. So it was kind of quite transformative, putting it on, you know, like she did, putting on her little glamorous dress. Yeah, but it was, I think they did a great job with the design of it and all that and, and the way it felt on the body. What was it like when Dylan to be killed by the dress? <laughs> or not be attacked by the dress, rather? <laughs> I really loved it. <laughs> it. It was actually my idea to have it smothering my face. And that's all you need to know about me. <laughs> uh, right there, one of you. You first. The question was about uh, how conscious were you of this movie being as comedic as it was? I was hoping it would be. I didn't, I didn't set out to make it this way. I think when you write something, you don't know how it's going to work out. When you look at that blank page, I, I, I just wanted to explore people's neurotic connection with clothing, whether it's feeling inadequate when you put something on, whether you feel empowered, or how you feel when you clear out someone's wardrobe who died, or, or all these feelings, whether it's arousal, disgust, and so on. So that, that was the number one thing. Um, but I guess to show the board of work, the frustration, uh, it, it just felt, it feels more cathartic in a way to laugh at these things that all of us experience at work. and. Um, you get this kind of thing making films as well. It's not just, you know, in my old day jobs. <laughs> it's, I think it's just always better to laugh. And as long as, as, long as you laugh at the situation and not, um, I don't know, it's, it's, it's a tricky, tricky balance, really. We'll go right there, and then you're next. And was there any in the balcony you just wanted to know? Okay, good. There and there. Uh, my question is for the actors. Uh, for the two of you, how would you play characters that were almost, well, it's, for Gwendolyn especially, it's almost aggressively libidinous. Aggressively what? Libidinous. They're very sexual characters, the, oh. even the way the dress was. Libidinous. Libidinous? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> the no, question was how, what it was like to play two characters that were so aggressive, as opposed towards each other, and aggressively yeah, sexual. Like, what? Sexual. Like, so, it's not, there's no shame in it, like, as you were saying, there's no judgment with the characters, and then exploring that sexuality and that almost sensuality with the dress. It's very liberating, I think. I think it's very liberating to see uh, female characters being liberated in their sexuality and, and uninhibited in that way and unafraid to explore sexuality. And I, I also enjoyed that for all of its uh, extremity, actually what Peter does is incredibly respectful and artful. And it's as much about the exquisitely beautiful kaleidoscopic effects that he's creating on the screen as it is about uh, prompting your mind to work and create and that's actually what's I think most enticing and exciting and erotic about those scenes is that so much of it is coming from you it's prompting your response um, and and to work with someone so incredibly respectful as well it's also hugely liberating um, I also, I, I loved the, the relationship between Gwen and Sheila and I loved playing that with Marianne and, uh, and because it's, it's delightful, it's delightful to, to play someone who's so unashamedly horrid. <laughs> chance to explore the longing that Sheila had was really nice because it took a while for her to be sort of satisfied and satiated in that um, and I, I, I especially love the scene when her and uh, Zach finally get to be intimate the way that it's shot is just like should be like that all the time. Maybe. It's just like, yeah, I'm looking at myself here. Yeah, yeah it was, it was uh, really, really something. Final question was over there. Yes? Uh, yeah, I was wondering if there was a, any specific Java film that you were inspired by, or, or, or just hanging on, or just 
The question is regarding um, Peter, your your influences, whether they were Jalo films or otherwise from a cinematic influences. Uh, there's more television. The Office, Ricky Gervais. Um, <laughs> I mean, seriously, I come from the same town. I, I don't know him at all, but um, I had well, I, like most of us, you know, we all had those kind of jobs, and um, I mean, I, I love Jalo. Um, maybe subconsciously, that atmosphere seep through, but it was, there was no explicit intention to to do that. Uh, I guess the influences came from, I mean, again, Keenholz, um, a lot of it came, came from real life, from department stores, from the catalogues they used to have, um, the whole design of these places, the atmosphere, the, the thick white carpets which kind of muffled the sound. Um, a lot of it came from my going to sleep at night with YouTube on the ASMR channel, um, <laughs> listening to whispering and page turning, lots of, lots of catalogues. Um, so, um, I guess what one influence was Carnival of Souls, um, the Herc Harvey film. There's a scene in a, in a department store there and when Candace Hillegloss is driving at night. And I, there were scenes of you at night and I was thinking of that. Um, I mean, otherwise it was just, Bits from films. I mean, Lethal Weapon when Mel Gibson gets the bad guy in a leg lock. <coughs> with the scene. I mean, I literally showed that to Richard. I showed that scene to him. I'm working out his legs around the shoplifter. Um, the Serge Gainsbourg's Retain One on Blue, where um, Joe Del Sandro's boyfriend, whenever he gets angry, he just yanks this plastic bag. I think we need to curate a in fabric series of just all these references. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much, please.